talking about how to find the common ground um, in the midst of all of the divisions in our world. Uh, it was a really nice gathering. We had a, a, a good handful of young people um, to, to spend the evening with. Um, and our next gathering is going to be um, on Thursday, September 9th. And because it's near Labor Day, we're going to be talking about labor. Um, the District UMW event will be uh, also in September. Um, and then... Put it on your calendars. Right now, we're hoping that everything can go forward perfectly. Uh, but the fall concert with David Glory and Stephen Harwood will be, uh, right now, it's scheduled for September 26th. That's a Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're hoping to make that a, a fantastic evening for everybody. Um, so look forward to, for more details, uh, but go ahead and save the date. Are there any other announcements as we begin? Okay, um, we were kind of talking about this in Sunday school this morning. If you think back to March 12, 2020, that was the day the earth started to stand still because that was when we went into all of our COVID protocols and so forth like that. And so at that time, what we did was we made, instead of just a prayer chain, we did an entire church chain so we could always call and everything like that. Well, now since we're back in church and together again and stuff, we really don't need to have that long a chain anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to redo the prayer chain. So I have two different uh, clipboards. I'm going to send one from this side, one from that side. If you want to be a part of the ministry of New Hope Prayer Chain, put your name on there, your phone number, and whether to text or call you, okay, because that's important. If you don't want to be on it anymore, that's okay, you know, uh, and then we'll get everybody divided up into sessions, with, and we can make sure that these prayer chains are going through properly, because sometimes they haven't been making it all the way through, and then people get to church and go, I 
didn't know that. <laughs> so anyway, we thought, well, we need to maybe kind of redo this a little bit and stuff. So I will send for a, one from here and one from there. If somebody's not here this Sunday that you think might want to still be a part of it, have them let me know, and I'll add them on to this. I'll wait about two weeks before we kind of put it together. Okay? All right. Thank you so much. I now have Fleetwood Mac's The Chain from Rupert's song. <laughs> and I'm sure it will be there until the end of the day. Um, thanks, Debbie, for getting that set together. Uh, this is one of the ways that we are able to stay in communication with, with one another. We are also able to stay in communication with one another uh, through our regular Sunday meeting, through email, and through Facebook. Um, so if you are not following us on Facebook, if you've got one, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and if you want to get signed up for emails, uh, let me know after the service if you're not getting our emails. Um, and uh, we'll be able to keep in touch with one another and make sure that we all know what's going on in the life of this community and the people of this community. Are there any other announcements as we begin? Okay, well, let us join together in our opening prayer, our, our call to worship. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, Lord, make, make haste to save us. Send forth your spirit, O oh Lord. And may the earth of the earth. The whole of creation proclaims your marvelous work. As, as, as we worship, increase our capacity to wonder and to life in your world. Amen. Amen. And now let us stand and sing our opening hymn.
as we give thanks for our Lord God and for all creation, all that he has made, let us join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And as the uh, Dad of Glory comes up to, to sing our hymn, our, our, our anthem, um, I have made a mistake in the printing of the bulletin. Uh, they will not be singing in the garden. Um, the gift will be a different song, um, which you will hear here in just a moment. <laughs>
continuing now, continuing now for a moment uh, from the book of Genesis, now jumping to the third chapter, verses 1 through 13 and 16 through 19. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit that is of the tree in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired and to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave me to be with, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from, of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all of the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Word of God from the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Nobel Peace Prize recipient Wangari Matai uh, once came and spoke at Oklahoma City University when I was there studying economics. Um, and she, she told her story of, of how she became involved in, in ecological restoration in, in her homeland of, of Kenya. And she said that uh, she had grown up under lush trees at the, at the base of Mount Kenya in Africa. And as a child, she had excelled in school. And she would often spend her time helping her mother plant and harvest crops from the fertile Kenyan soil. Eventually, she was awarded a scholarship to attend college in the United States. And after six years of studying and working in the US, she returned to her home. But when she returned those six years later, she found it very different than she had remembered. When she returned, her first thought was, where are the trees? Where are the trees? Well, developers and governments had, had subdued the earth, but, but now the poor were reaping the consequences. She saw women hauling firewood for miles. The land that had once produced abundant food now lied barren. There were no birds to be found. The trees of her homeland were being cut down all across her beloved country, and, and slowly, in response, the desert began to grow. And so she did something quite simple. She started to plant trees. And she started with nine. She planted nine trees, simply nine trees. And then she began to plant more. 
And then she starts a nursery for saplings, and, and she gives them to the women of her town, telling them, our lives will be better once there are trees again. She gives them to them and says, we are planting the seeds of hope. And as they plant the trees, the life begins to return to the soil. The trees block the wind that had stripped the soil of, of its top layer. And the birds that had helped to pollinate the plants begin to return. The leaves of the trees block the harsh sun, harsh sun that scorched the plants. And, and then in the fall, when, when the leaves fell to the earth, they began to restore the soil's nutrients. And so with the help of women all over Kenya, they, they plant a green belt of trees across the land and begin to push back the desert. It's an amazing transformation, taking something that had once been green and then had become desert and making it green again. Now, Wangari Matai's story is not without struggle. She was beaten and jailed on many occasions for protecting the trees. And it's, it's a story that we've heard time and time again. Now, earlier this month, the United Nations released a new report on the climate. It said, essentially, that it's going to take a lot more than simply planting trees to save the Earth's most vulnerable and poor from the effects of a climate catastrophe. And so there have been many experiences, many responses to this report. Some have been anger. Some responses have been fear. Some responses have been denial. And, and other responses, maybe the worst of all, resignation, hopelessness. But none of these kinds of responses, the, the authors of the report noted, were likely to help us solve the problem. And so, what should we do? How are we supposed to respond as people of faith? Well, I'm going to ask us to, to look at our scripture reading for today. Now, another preacher uh, once noted on this passage that, that God has in scripture a tendency to say some truly outrageous things. And one good example is from our scripture today. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. In other words, have dominion is to be like a king. To have charge over something. You can say where something is supposed to go. You can say what is supposed to be done with something. But ultimately, you also have the task of protecting it. Or to put it a little bit differently, God is telling us in this passage to take care of things. To take care of everything. Uh, did we volunteer for this? Like, <laughs> did, 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 was this something that we said yes to? Like, did, does anybody remember being up in heaven with God if there was like an existence before this life and God being like, all right, when I send you down there, you're going to have to take care of things. And we'd be like, okay, I, I say yes to this. I mean, I, I personally don't remember an interaction like that. And so just feeling that, that, that God has tasked us with this might feel a little bit unfair. How are we supposed to take care of everything? Now, scholars and, and preachers have, have fastened on to the words subdue and have dominion in that, that, that appear in, these, in, this, in this scripture. And they've argued about their meaning and, and the difference between subdue and have dominion. But the, the Hebrew writers of the Old Testament often liked to put words in pairs. All, almost all of, all of Hebrew scripture is, is poetry. I mean, even the parts that are, are, are prose in our narrative are, are filled with, with profound poetic elements. And so the, the words here, subdue and to have dominion over, are really two sides of the same coin. They're not opposites, but, but more like what I would perhaps call taking care. Taking care. But that just brings us back, I guess, to where we started. How are we supposed to care for creation? Well, noted Kentucky author and essayist Wendell Berry is known for having said, think globally, act locally. But he also 
argued and, and spoke very often that, that we should both think and act locally. We need to be informed, paying attention to the, to the guidance of specialists on climate and energy and, and the best practices for protecting and renewing the earth. But for most of us, our energy and effort should be focused on what we do here, here in our own community and in our own lives, because no matter how we feel about climate science, and I've decided to put aside as best as I can the, the, the political side, but, and by that I mean I've decided not to endorse any specific policies or, or candidates on this issue, right? Um, but no matter how we feel about the climate science, as stewards of creation tasked by God to take care of the earth, we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities in our own house, in our backyard, and in our community for the glorious gift of creation. And isn't it truly a gift? Observe in Psalm 104 how, how the author, who, who sought to glorify God and enjoy God forever, stood in the midst of nature. He has given wine to gladden the heart of man and oil to make his face shine. This is the day which the Lord has made, he exalts. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And here is what I think is perhaps the most important thing for us to remember when we are thinking about taking care of the earth. And that is to experience it as something of joy. It is something of joy. God's creation is filled with joy. Joy leads us away from despair. Joy connects us with God. Joy is what God wants for us. And when Jesus came, he, he said to, to his followers and to the people who were listening to him that he had come so that we would have life and have life abundantly. And so let us rejoice and be glad in, in the glory of the garden that God has made for us. <clears throat> Taking joy in creation helps us to remember that, that the value of the world is more than a number on a balance sheet. Now, one of the problems the report of, from the UN says is that, that most of the humans on this planet, we have a tendency to think of the environment as, as something that is separate from us. And um, I think, you know, this is actually one of the advantages of, of living in an area that has greenery around us, right? We are constantly exposed to the environment, but um, a, a large portion of the world lives in cities, and I can speak from, from my own experience as, as having lived in Los Angeles for five years, you do tend to think that the environment is something that is over there somewhere, right? It's far away from us. But I think that no matter where we live, we all have the tendency to think of ourselves in one category and the rest of, of creation in another category, right? And we, we might think of that when we, when we read through the scriptures and, and think of ourselves as being the last thing, the crowning achievement of God's creation, right? That's the tendency on the sixth day, the day before God rested, after God had made everything else, God creates us and then he looks out in the creation and says, this is very good, right? Every time up until now, God had said it's good, this time God says, very good. But the truth is that, that we are not something that is separate from our environment. And that's even true in Scripture. Now, it reminds me of, of the indigenous defenders of the rainforest in Brazil, who, when they were asked, why are you defending the nature? That was the question they were asked. Why are you defending the nature? They, they answered, we are not defending the nature. We are the nature. We are defending ourselves. We are the nature. This is the reason that, that indigenous and First Nations peoples have been at the forefront of climate activism the world over. They remember what, what so many people have forgotten, that the humans and the land are, are inseparable and, and intertwined. In her book, As Long As Grass Grows, indigenous scholar Dina Julia Whitaker explains that indigenous sites are sacred 
because people believe that there's a piece of me in that land and, and a piece of that land in me. And maybe that's where my ancestor, ancestors are buried, or maybe it's a place that my tribe has gone for centuries, but the point is that the land and the people are like one. We see that same message in Scripture. In the story of creation, when God creates humankind, God takes dirt and breathes into it, and the dirt, the, the clay, the earth, becomes a human being. From earth, which in Hebrew is Adamah, God creates man, Adam. Earth and humankind, Adamah and Adam, or in, or in the words of the indigenous scholars that they've been saying from the beginning, we are the nature. And it's made clear again in our second scripture reading today, when after turning away from God and being sent out of the garden, God tells the man and the woman that now the soil is cursed. It will be difficult to bring forth life from the soil. And then, in the same way, God tells them that the same is true of them. It will be difficult for them as humans to bring forth life. It will be difficult for the soil to bring forth life. It will be difficult for the people to bring forth life. Their fate and the fate of the soil, of the earth, is the same because they are one in the same. And so God tells us to subdue the earth, yes, but that also means to tend to its health, because we are the nature, and our health is wound up in the health of the earth and its soil. The land is sacred. And so subduing the earth, yes, that can mean harvesting minerals for our consumption, but subduing the earth also means planting trees. It means living in harmony, and, and because we are made from the earth, subduing the earth also means subduing ourselves. And so if we are to take care of nature, of creation, of the earth, as God has called us to do, we start in our own homes by subduing the earth that is within us, by cultivating our own hearts so that the seed of love and mercy and care that God has scattered would find fertile soil within us. And so maybe that means subduing our own desires, our desires to consume more resources than we actually need, our desire for ease and convenience. But maybe it's subduing the fear that we won't have enough if we don't take more than we need. And who else has ever thought that? If we don't hoard our resources, I mean, this really came, we, we all experienced this with toilet paper last year, right? right? The idea that, that if we only take what we need, that, that we will have enough is a radical idea in our world. Maybe it means that we subdue the myth of scarcity and accept God's gift of abundance so that we recognize when enough is enough and, and we realize that God is more than enough. As Christians, our response to, to climate change, it, it shouldn't be denial or despair. It shouldn't also be anger or apathy. It should be determination. Determination to care for the earth and its people, and especially the least of these, the poor and vulnerable who stand to lose the most. And so yes, we, we are called to respond. God calls us to care for the vulnerable, God calls us to humble or subdue ourselves and, and subdue our overconsumption of natural resources. But most importantly, God calls us to take joy. To take joy in creation. And, and God has given us this wide and beautiful earth to take joy in. And honestly, joy is the best act of resistance that we have. Joy and awe and wonder at God's gracious gift of creation is the best resistance that we have to the powers of fear and death and destruction. I have a, a poster in my room, and, and you, can, you can kind of see it up above. Uh, it says, fear wanders the future, but love plants here. Um, this is a poster uh, by Scott Erickson, uh, who goes by Scott the Painter on Instagram. I have definitely recommend that, that you check him out. Um, and this is actually a series that he did for Advent. Um, the idea of fear and love being opposites. 
Fear and I think joy are also sometimes opposites. The idea that we don't get too worried about the future because we know that with great love, we can root into the present and plan something that will grow. And I think that brings us hope. So let me end with a story uh, from an ecologist, Dr. Kathleen Ferris, about how she first knew that she was destined to become a botanist. She writes, Tiny neon green shoots poked up from the dark spring earth, tempting, tantalizing, impossibly green, they shone like jewels against the bare soil. And I stood on the side of the house beneath the old brick wall and the delicate spreading fingers of the Japanese maple. The new shoots of my mother's prized lilies calling out to my three-year-old fingertips. They drew me in like sirens, steering me toward a scolding. It was late March in St. Louis. The days were chilly and damp, but with a hint of April's coming warmth. I was alone in the garden, playing my three-year-old games while my parents worked inside, making dinner and discussing the day. I can't say exactly what led to the next sequence of events, what thoughts I had before the first domino fell. Perhaps I was pretending to harvest my crops, and the hosts, the lilies, were just the nearest thing to hand, the first casualty of my imagination. But though I don't remember the specifics of that day, I do remember the feeling of it. And the feeling was of overwhelming attraction. Attraction to the beauty of the lily's new spring growth. And so I snapped off their jaunty green heads, marveling at the smooth feel of them in my fingertips, the way they glinted in the dappled sun below the, ma below the maple. And then I brought them proudly to my mother to display the verdant bounty cupped gingerly in my tiny hands. And she was angry. <laughs> angrier than I had ever seen her before and angrier than I had ever seen her since. I had ruined her entire garden of lilies. Every last lily had been plucked. She had loved those lilies. And so I got in huge trouble. After my punishment and after my tears, when the storm of broken stems and spirits had passed, my mother said to me, Katie, you know what I think? I think that flowers and plants are much more joyful when we let them thrive. And I also think that you should become a botanist when you grow up. Because then you can pick any plant you want and you will never get in trouble. <laughs> so my prayer for you and for all of us today is that we become botanists too. Botanists of love. May your joy at the marvel of God's good creation lead you to plant as much as you harvest, to give as much as you take, to care for the earth and its people, and to plant love and joy all the days of your life. All glory be to God. Amen. Our next song is going to be in the little black book, 2052. The words will probably be on the screen. I have faith. There's God. <coughs> Debbie's going to play through it once for us.
things about nature and about creation is just how abundant life can be, how much we receive from the bountiful gifts of the earth, um, and I believe that that is a reflection of it also bearing that image of God, the abundance of God's goodness and God's generosity towards God's children. So as we remember today, the generosity that we have received from God, all of the gifts that we have received, we prepare to give back just a portion. My prayer is that today we do that with joy. Will the ushers please come forward?
Let's pray for our children and all the schools. Right. Yes, for everyone who is involved in our school system yes. this year, for all of the children, for their parents, for our teachers, um, that they would be given everything that they need to be able to have a successful school year, and, and most importantly, a, a safe and healthy school year. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. What other joys or concerns do we bring today? Like a little pacemaker repair about a week ago. Oh, well. All right. Well, glad to have Jerry with us. Uh, tickling the ivories. Is that, is that, can we say that? Is that a thing that people say? Uh, yes, we're glad to have you with us today. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Collins is doing well, and she is drinking from the bottle. Yes, I saw the pictures. I've seen the pictures. Yeah. It's always good to get to get off of that ventilator um, so that you can drink from a bottle. She still has her feeding too, but it's uh, through, not through her mouth, and I uh, think we're at 4-7 is what they said this morning. All right. Continuing so, to grow. Continuing to grow. Continuing to grow. That's all we can ever hope. I know, and everything else is looking good. Fantastic. For Collins uh, and for all of Collins' family, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's go to God in a time of silent prayer. Creator God, we ask that you teach us to see you in the beauty of the universe. For all things, all of your creation speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for everything that you have made. Give us the grace to perceive that we are all connected to everything that is. God, whom we love, we stand before you with open and humble hearts. In our imagination, allow us to see and hear and feel the beautiful expressions of the earth that speak to each of us. Mountains, rivers, prairies, oceans, forests, meadows, trees and flowers, show us our place in this world as siblings, as kin to all of the non-human creatures with whom we share this earth. They too came from your hand. They are yours, filled with your presence and your tender look, and not one of them is forgotten in your sight. We give thanks for all of the human beings on this earth, created from dust, and yet crowned with glory and filled with the Spirit. Those we know and those who are strangers, those near to us and those far away, all of us beautiful, all of us flawed. We thank you for the sun, for water, for soil, for air, on which our lives depend moment by moment. In silence we are aware of our frailty, our complete dependence on your creation, that nurtures us and sustains our every breath. Creator God, we enjoy the abundant fruits of the earth, and yet we acknowledge that, that we in the developed world have often wasted the gifts of the earth, taking more than our share, leaving our sisters and brothers and siblings in other places in poverty and in need. Renew our minds and transform us into servants of your creation so that her richness and bounty will sustain not only us, but generations to come after us. In gratitude, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us stand and sing together. It's number 147 in your hymn book, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Stand again.
May you have joy in all of the goodness and the fullness which God has created. And may that joy inspire you to care for all of the plants and animals and people and ecosystems of the earth so that all people might experience joy in God's green earth and God's good creation. Go forth from this place in peace, filled with joy. Amen. Amen.